Now, the Brandon Committee was actually officially dissolved in 1987 after releasing Our Common Future, also known as the Brundtland Report. So somewhere down the lane, whether you were a high income country or a low income country, or you were somewhere in the middle, the concentration was more towards the economic growth and not towards the environmental sustainability. The countries needed some way to reconcile the economic development with the environmental protection. So this is mandatory. Good morning and welcome to the first session in Chapter 1, Unit 3, Second Semester, BCA, Sustainable Development, where we are going to speak about the Brundtland Committee. There has been many committees in this world which has been working towards the sustainable development. Probably the mission remains the same, but the way how to achieve the objectives of the mission has always been challenging. Nevertheless, the Brundtland Commission, formerly known as the World Commission on the Environmental Sustainable Development, a sub-organization of the United Nations, they aimed to unite the countries in pursuit of sustainable development. Now, there has been a race in this world to unite all the countries, to make each and every country realize the importance of sustainable development. Why? Because at the end of the day, if you want to survive, if you want to tell in this world that you are going to make this planet Earth a sustainable one for the generations to come, that means we need to change the plan of action. We need to change the dimensions of our thinking. And that's exactly what the Brunton committee wanted to instigate among the nation. Now in the year 1983, it was founded by Javier Perez and he was the Secretary General of the United Nations, appointed Go Harlem Brundtland, the former Prime Minister of Norway as the chairperson of the commission. So now you know how did the name Brundtland came into picture. This was because of the former Prime Minister of Norway who had taken up the chance of bringing up this entire commission. Now Brundtland was chosen due to her strong background in the sciences and that too for the public health altogether. So she had a insight and in-depth knowledge in terms of social science and in healthcare. Now, what happened because of that? Now, the Brundtland Committee was actually officially dissolved in 1987 after releasing Our Common Future, also known as the Brundtland Report. The document popularized the term sustainable development and won the award also in the year 1991. In 1988, the Center for the Common Future replaced the Commission. Now, that's very, very important for all of us to know why, because let me just tell you the factor here. After this award winning ceremony that took place for a long time, we started understanding in the long run that this is the opportunity that we all have in terms of changing, in terms of moving forward, in terms of understanding how our future has to be. So what we wanted to do here is that the ideology of common future started setting among the United Nations and they started telling the nations what are all the steps that we need to follow according to the Brundtland report. Now moving further, before Brundtland, that is 10 years, in the year 1972 United Nations Conference on Human Environment, a number of global environmental challenges has not been adequately addressed. The era of industrialization had forgotten nature. So at some point of time, we did not know what's the meaning of this. We forgot that the earth has to be maintained clean and green for the survival. We only thought that the rapid industrialization surge could make this nation, could make this world a better place to live in. But unfortunately, we forgot that unless and until you are going to get a clean, green air, you're going to have a quality standard of living, you're going to have good, clean drinking water, you're going to have a natural surrounding that's going to sustain you, you're not going to be a part of this planet Earth anymore. So that's why... The question came back from the Brundtland Commission saying that what have we done in terms of supporting Mother Nature? What is the step that we have taken to sustain this earth? So that's why we came back with the 1980s, the World Bank increasingly 
intervened the economic reforms with the social reforms and notably after the World War 1945. Now this is the time that was taken up by the Brundtland in terms of the economic agenda also. They wanted to bring in the economic sustainability factor. They wanted each one of us to understand it is not just economics but it is environmental economics. You need to survive, you need to sustain, you need to build a better place to live in. Now. The history tells us very, very clearly here when we start talking about it talks about the underlying problem that was reducing poverty in the low income countries without the excavating of the global and the local environment burdens. Neither the high income northern countries nor the low income southern countries were willing to give up on the economic growth. Probably in the world, the most challenging part of the story remains that nobody wants to come out of the cycle of economic growth. Everybody believes that this is the opportunity. Let's develop more. Let's build it more. Let's make this country even more prosperous. See, for example, in India, when we started the cycle of make in India, the ideology was very clear that we wanted to give the economic reforms a further push by making India sustainable and be independent by in terms of the production activities. We wanted India to become the production hub of the world. We wanted that the skills and the necessary technology that was needed to make this production happen has to be built in over a period of time. So our concentration was more towards the development of the economy and not towards the development of environment. So somewhere down the lane, whether you were a high income country or a low income country or you were somewhere in the middle, the concentration was more towards the economic growth and not towards the environmental sustainability. But nevertheless, what happens here is that when the environment threatens you back with pollution, rain, deforestation, desertification, sudden cloud bursts, floods, or landslides, you start looking back. You start thinking again, what have I done? Is it right or wrong? Are we on the correct path? Today, when you read a news in your paper or when you watch your television sets and suddenly a news breaks out saying that a sudden cloud burst in Uttarakhand, then automatically you are worried. You're now worried about this factor that how is this happening? Where am I missing the picture? Though we have satellites, we have drone, we have technology that is supporting us on a greater venture. But then the question that remains in our mind is that have we really done something to make ourselves viable? To make ourselves sustainable on this earth. Now we can't go against the nature. We can't challenge the nature. We have to cooperate with the nature. We have to understand the nature and build a forum, build a cycle in such a manner that we are able to develop it all together. Now, the countries needed some way to reconcile the economic development with the environmental protection. So this is mandatory. This is exactly mandatory. Why? Because let's try to understand this. Countries needed some way. Now, this is very, very important here. Why? Because at one point of time, the environmental protection is very, very important for all of us. We need to protect the environment. We need to tell people how this can happen. So at, you know, at the end of the day, when you start asking yourself this question, every country needs to support, needs to build in a system through which they can actually take care of the environment. They can actually build a sustainable environment. So what was the exact challenge? How did this go through? Now, the local environment problems were a result of the local developments or because of the global production that forced the low income countries to destroy their own environment. Now, that was one question. The second one, did the environmental burdens result from the destructive economic growth or lack of economic development? Now, I, I go back to this question. Why? Because when I talk about the word economic growth and with the word destructive, I'm trying to signal something. I'm trying to signal a negative aspect. I'm trying to tell you about some important factor that Economic growth, though it is on the positive side, but if you're going to bring in a negative factor, if you're going to bring in an impact in such a manner that the negative growth of economy is going to hurt your environment, that is going to hurt your living conditions, then we are not in for it. 
We don't want that kind of an economic growth to happen in any part of this world. That's exactly what most of the countries are trying to answer. Why? Because definitely it is not a lack of economic development. Every country has been trying to take some step to industrialize their nation, to gain some employment traction, to make their country technologically superior, to make their country understandable move from that low wage income factor to a higher per capita growth segment altogether. The markets have been trying to pull up. Everything has been happening, no doubts about it. But the question that comes in here is that, is it a destructive economic growth or a constructive economic growth? So definitely this question has to be answered at some point of time. Followed by reconciling the economy and the environment would require more resource efficient technologies or social, political, structural changes. Uh, are we going back to that part of society, blaming the government, blaming the system, saying that because of the society, because of the government, because of the people, or let's just go back a step and try to understand, will that require a resource efficient mode? So is it about efficiency or is it about the effective system? So this is the question that needs to be answered in the coming years. Moving further, the 1980 World Conservation Strategy Union, actually they had bought in a very, very brief report. They came up very clearly on a chapter called as sustainable development. And this is the word. Let me tell you what you would be learning throughout the year because the subject itself is that. And secondly, this is a topic which everybody wants to focus upon. So the UN created an independent commission. They wanted this alone to be an agenda, which was asked to provide an analysis of existing problems, ideas such as independent on the thought on international development issues, the brand commission that was coming up and the independent commission on disarmament and the security plans. So one side, the UN was trying to understand the meaning of sustainable development and on the other side, they started getting this into action. So they bought in a separate commission, they bought in a separate set of people who could enact on the plans on the ideas, the visions and the goal, take it forward and make this truly working all together. So that's why I would say that the Brundtland Committee is a turning point on sustainable development, followed by the structure. The Brundtland Commission was chaired by the former Norwegian and the Prime Minister, followed by that of civil servants and other people. It was represented by 21 different countries. Many members were important political figures in their home countries, such as William Ruckler, the former head of the environmental agency altogether. So you had prominent people who could make the nation understand the importance of sustainable development. They could make people reach in terms of the Environmental Protection Act. The agenda was very, very clear. They wanted the nations to understand the rising alarm in terms of making your environment cleaner and greener altogether followed by the commission focused on setting up networks to promote environmental stewardship. Most of these networks made connections between governments and non-governments such as that of the Bill Clinton's Council on Sustainable Development which invites the government and business leaders, no doubt about it. The Brundtland Commission that has been most successful in terms of forming the international ties between multinational companies. So you would be able to see here that the commission actually tied up with various organization leaders in order to make and reach the ideas to every corner of the world. So this is not going to be an easy thing for most of us to understand because at the end of the day, this is what has carried us forward in terms of a holistic approach, trying to make every nation understand the need for survival at the end of the day. So definitely this commission has been one of the biggest thing in terms of understanding the growth and structure. Followed by the economic growth, which is the pillar that most of the group focus when attempting to attain more sustainable efforts and development in trying to build their economies. Many countries focus on their efforts on the resource extraction, which leads to unsustainable efforts of environmental protection and factors. While the commission was able to change the association between economic growth and resource, no doubt about it, the total worldwide consumption of resources projected to increase in terms of the future. Agenda 21, nobody has to worry about it. It reinforces the importance of finding the methods to generate economic growth without hurting the entire thing. So at the end of the day, what we are trying to see here is 
that we are trying to understand that the economic growth in many countries have been focusing on the resource extraction part and we are also trying to build in an economic growth which will contain the best of the resources and also put in a limit in terms of the developmental access. We do not want a system that just raises ahead in terms of developing and destroying the environment in the long run. Now, the environment protection that has also been for a very long time for the last 20 years leading to great improvements. Of course, yes, in the year 2010, let me tell you, US and Europe added more power capacity from the renewable sources such as wind and sun. So this shows that there are countries who are trying to work on renewable resources and it is possible for nations to adapt to something new. It is not mandatory every time that a country has to stick back to the traditional power factors. But yes, there are availabilities for you in terms of usage of renewable resources. And this could probably be a lesson to many of us who have been working like India. For example, when we want to make a shift from the petrol to that of EV base altogether, we could probably harness the idea of even more like hybrid cells or, you know, fuel cells technology and other factors from these countries. And we could probably create a technology that is sustainable globally and make India even more a cleaner and greener environment. Now, the eco-city development occurring around the world helps us to develop, helps us to implement the conservation smart grids and other programs, LED streetlights with energy efficient building. Yes, it has been going on and roughly 80% of the natural resources which are being used each year are consumed about 20% of the world population. So no doubt about it. Now, this eco-city development, the energy efficiency, this is what we have been speaking about because this has been able to help us to reduce the gap and make the resources even more efficient in the long run as far as possible. Now, and the last but not the least part where I really want to focus is on social equality, which are the pillars of sustainable development. Why? Because at the end of the day, this is all for the well-being of the people. So if the people are not fine, the people are not being given that, then the growing gap between the rich and the income is evident enough. Why? Because the richer households are getting rich and rich every day and the poor household are becoming poorer. So we want to reduce the gap. We want to bring in that equality and equity, the distribution of land, assets and wealth, which will definitely bring in a new pattern to live on. Now, the social equality is also talking about, which is, you know, the global equality, which has been decreasing by 1% on the world's own population. Now, the 40% of the wealth that has been created and the poorest, that is about 50% of the world owning around only 1%. Now, the commission reduced the number of people living than less than dollar to just half of what is used. And many of the approaches that has been, we are talking about the environment and the usage of it. This could be also contributed for the economic growth of India. India and China, which we are complaining about the poverty and other factors for a very long time. So what was happening here is that the poverty and the economic situations that were prevailing in the developing countries, there was a lot of rising inequalities. Using this factor called a social equality, we were able to reduce it and we were able to bring in a better picture. With that, I come to the end of the session. I hope and believe that all the resources that have been shared through this session will be of a great help to you both in terms of exam as well as in the practical learning standpoint. In the upcoming session, we are going to talk about the indicators and we will be talking about the various sustainable goals. But until then, stay tuned, stay blessed and stay enlightened forever. Thank you once again for joining me today on this wonderful session.